that looks right. I don't know. We'll find out when I look That's at it. Right. And I'm cut off like this. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. Thanks for spending some time with us. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy. I'm joined by Andrew, as I often am. And in the back seat today, Tommy Given. We are traveling to Free Training Day Mid Atlantic, and we're taking another opportunity to record an episode because when you get a bunch of martial artists together, what are they talking about? Martial well, arts. If Tommy's in the back seat, it's about 50 <laughs> 50. But there's a lot of martial arts chat, so we might as well record it and maybe focus it a little bit. On today's episode, we're doing a Q&A. Andrew's going to pop up some questions for Tommy and I in a moment. But for all of you out there, if you are new to the show, make sure you check out whistlekick.com and see all the things that we do to connect, educate, and entertain you, the traditional martial artist of the world. And if you haven't been to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you're missing out because we do transcripts of every episode. We have links and photos, and you can you know dig through and find episodes that you missed as we come up on episode 1000, we get closer every week. Uh, Andrew and I are searching that to go, wait, did we have that person on? Because sometimes it's hard to remember. And if we can't remember, I imagine you have a hard time remembering too. But that's enough for me to chat at you right now as I watch this BMW decide whether or not they want to be part of our trunk. And I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew. All right. and. What that means is if you are only listening, you're like, why is he looking at a BMW while recording an episode? That's because we're in the car. In the car. In the car. In driving the car. to Free Training Day Mid-Atlantic down in Philly area. That was a cool car. That is the new gen Corvette. Oh, that's cool. I don't think I would be that risky with that Corvette. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's a, uh, yeah. So we are going to do a Q&A today. A qua. A qua. And I... I don't think I want to call it a rapid fire Q&A, which is what we normally call them, because we got Tommy in the car. That's true. And I don't know that Tommy could answer questions I, I think I think we should both be held a sub banner of timetable, lest this episode become lengthy. Okay. Do you, can you do that, Tommy? I'll do my best. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is, I'm going to ask Jeremy first. And then Tommy, you can you can chime in after. Same question. Same question. So here's the question, and this question comes in from Stephen Watson. How often do or should you train in everyday clothing slash streetwear? So how often do I? Frequently, but not for lengthy duration. So you know, if, if I'm if I'm trying on clothes, can I kick it? During the day, I'm, I'm kicking and punching and maybe doing forms in the kitchen or something, but not for a long period of time. The majority of my training is in a game. Do I think I should do more training in street clubs? Yes. The only reason we have not implemented street clothes days in my school is because on any given night, the majority of my students are in street clothes because they're newer or you know, without going too deep into it, have not progressed in rank and thus do not feel that they're not required to wear a uniform. So to have street clothes day would really just be about me wearing my street clothes <laughs> more than it would be anyone else. Um, I absolutely see the value in doing so. And I think that's all I have to say. I'll pass it to Tommy. So, uh, since we retire, my training clothes are my everyday clothes and street clothes. So I pretty much train daily, every day, kind of often. Mm. So that's where I'm at now. When I was working, though, as a lineman, I had to make sure I wore clothing that was loose enough so I could move around and for safety reasons. But I would also put bands, like, say, on my sweatshirt because you don't want to get that hung up. Nice to be uh, electrical alignment. You don't want to get that hung up on anything for obvious reasons. And he had to be able to, you know, climb the pole and scale ladders. And then, obviously, I would change up because I had very heavy boots on and only steel toe. So your method when you're doing is different. And to piggyback on Welcome what to New Jerry York. said, though, was um, 
I do have days where street clothes are mandatory in class. And they do it at different times of the year. Fall, uh, being in Vermont, they would have to wear their winter clothes that day. And that can be rubber boots and that kind of thing. And we do the whole class on however they're dressed. I, I'm imagining winter clothes, street clothes day it is like that scene in uh, A Christmas Story where the kid can't put his arms down. And he falls down and can't get up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I dig it. All right. Ready for the next question? Yes. Start so, with Tommy. So, Tommy, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Uh, this question comes from Victor, and it builds off of the last question. And the question is, what are benefits to continuing to train in traditional uniforms? Oh, wow. So, that's a tough one. Um, the benefits would be, in a traditional uniform, generally they're designed for military or, or warm-up type uh, applications. For example, in a karate gi, there's ways that you can put that on and grab and move. In judo gis, it's obvious where the extra padding in the shoulders, and that kind of thing. In the keto gi, with the free movement of your, your hakama or your bottom, This is something that I've thought about a bit. Uh, <clears throat> people who know their whistle kick trivia know that we've released a couple different iterations of uniforms. It's not something we're actively doing now, something I want to get back into. But it's something I've thought about because if you look at what we wear day to day, our civilian clothes, if you will, have embraced more technical fabrics, right? Like I'm wearing some jeans that have some stretch to them, Andrew. I know you love your yep. jeans with stretch to them. Uh, it is not uncommon for most of what women wear to be stretchy, whether that's, you know, leggings or jean, you know, jegging sort of things. I hate traffic. Yeah. Morning. So, hold on. Prioritizing. Oh, we have a merge. That's why. Oh, and we're in the one that has to merge. All right, let's do that. So, um, when I was a kid, and even, you know, through my 20s, we would have said, it just as, as Tommy's talking about, it's about mobility. You know, I wasn't putting on a pair of Lee jeans and kicking anything above my ankle. Maybe waist, as a kid. But with that reason gone, we're left with a couple things. One, the, the sort of militaristic tradition of everyone wearing the same sort of thing. So it gives us a common base to work from, um, it's called a uniform, right? It is uniform. We're doing we're doing roughly the same thing, wearing roughly the same attire. That's a good point. And that can be unifying. And I think that that is often a very positive thing. But I think there's, in, in this era, I think there's something that's even more important, and I don't think most people realize it. It's something that's very important to me personally. And that is, it gives me delineation between my training life and my non-training life. When I put on my gi, when I put on my belt, I'm in that mode. And for me, that's really helpful, really important. To the point where I try to have, uh, I'll just be overly simplistic, special clothes for the different roles in my life. Mm. If I'm going to the gym, there are clothes that I wear that I don't usually wear doing other things. Uh, 
when I had the house, you know, I sold the house a few months ago, but prior to that, I had working in the yard clothes. And it helped me put myself in the mindset of whatever that task was. And I liked that. So. All right. There you go. Yeah, that's good. I dig it. Uh, all right. Uh, Jeremy, this one's for you first. Uh, do you think it's important for a martial artist to learn less than lethal tool use? 100%. So this is... The, the, if you spend any time on social media, which you shouldn't, <laughs> but we all do. Yeah, Steve, you get trolled. We all get trolled. Yeah, but inevitably on a large portion of videos about self-defense, you get someone who clearly has little to no experience training making a comment about the uselessness of traditional martial arts because of firearms. Guns are really good. They're really good at only doing one thing. That's killing people. The majority of time you are in a self-defense situation, you do not need to kill the person. If you think you do, you either live in an incredibly violent area, and I'm sorry, or more likely, you have a poor understanding of the reality of violence. We need an entire continuum of, of violent options from the annoying non-touch, right? Somebody gets in your face and you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get close to them as a, whoa, all the way up to and including the ability to take a life. But here's the, here's the, the thing. The inverse to that, that continuum include, is someone's willingness to perform that action. The, more, the closer you get to lethal, the less likely someone is willing to deploy that option. Even if it is warranted. Because we live in a modern, healthy society that values life and not killing people. <laughs> when I teach self-defense, this is something I talk about. The majority of the tools that I teach in a self-defense context are not only non-lethal, but non-injurious. Hmm. Tell me, what do you think? So, I agree 100% with all of that. Um, there are certain concepts that you teach that are very non-lethal, but the concept of it in the exercise and in training as well can help you in many other ways. Especially in the idea of low impact or healing. There's a martial art aspect to that, but there's also, you know, healing when it comes to your lungs, your liver, your kidneys, and all that. But also having a, a really violent job in some of my jobs and um, circumstances that I've been in where force was necessarily and actually even with permission where deadly force is authorized, you have to be serious about that. And, there, and I do, for example, like he was just talking about social media, a knife video, and somebody is always a comment, would that work if somebody's really charging you hard? Or, How's it, is it fun to play, you know, patty cake, you know, while you're on there? And really, like that's, that's like their comment. And so you, you, you ignore it, you move on. And there's a part of you that just wants to put your address in there and have them show up um, and come take a, take a class. Realize that there is a lot of value in the training of it, in the exercise, you know, in the concept movement of it. Uh, Jeremy does a lot of um, <clears throat> block, grab, push, trap, or push, trap, offer. Those kind of drills help you into the next level, but during a safe environment in which you're practicing, essential. Yeah. Actually, it's mandatory, in my opinion. All right. So, keeping on that same vein, Tommy, how early should or do you develop de-escalation tactics in students? Day one. Um, just because you have an emotion doesn't mean it's a good one and doesn't mean you need to act on it. So when you're trying to de-escalate like out of anything, it's always important. Especially, you know, a lot of my students are in grade school and there's always that one kid that's just a, you know, a bully or has something where they just seem to get it, draw attention onto themselves by picking on somebody else. Um, 
to de-escalate that. And uh, however it means, too, different ways of whether cracking a joke or sidestepping it. Um, but to ignore it, then two people get mad. Mm. So be able to enter in, enter it and de-escalate is a far better decision. Uh, we're all taught as martial artists, right? Walk a mile to avoid a fight, but once in it, don't back down an inch. There's a lot of ground in between there. Mm. Sure. There's yep. a lot of ground in between. What about you, Jeremy? Lane splitting tripped me out. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, we acknowledge it from day one. We don't spend a lot of time talking about it at any one time. When, when we're talking about self-defense, when we're working self-defense curriculum, it comes up, we talk about it, and I sprinkle it through. I don't spend a lot of time talking about it for two reasons. One, it's boring. My students don't don't want to spend a lot of time with That's it. That's true. So if I spend a bunch of time focused on it, they're going to tune out. They're not going to get much anyway. Two, in order to properly de-escalate, you have to have the confidence that you could defend yourself with reasonable chance of success. Otherwise, you're not de-escalating. You're begging. Mm. And if you're begging that's gonna come through. If you've already been selected as a victim, you're playing more into the psychology that has made them select you. So we have to be really careful of that. Generally, what I'm talking to my students about when it's de-escalation is run. Especially if I'm talking to the kids. Yep. Your first job is to run. If you fight, you fight only so much as you need to so you can run. And we keep it very simple for them in that way. Because anything beyond that is more nuanced than a typical six to eight year old is going to be able to handle. Yeah, sure. So, is it important? Yes. Do I include it from day one? Yes. Is it a focus? No. Hmm. All right. Thanks for that distinction. That was good. Yeah, that, that was, was good. good. That was no, this is, this is good. I. This is fun having the three of us. You guys are... Uh, You're doing a, gr you a great job. Oh, no, I'm good right Brothers? now. Oh, okay. okay. Um, all right. How about this question comes from Noah Dever. Thank you, Noah. Um, and I know Jeremy's answer. In fact, I think this question may have come up, but I know it hasn't been with Tommy here. So, Jeremy, what is your go-to music for training? I don't like stuff with vocals if I'm using, if, if it's in a class setting. And, and for the audience, Noah and Craig at their school often have music playing, and it's usually pop, and it's quiet, and it fills the space, and it does a fantastic job with that. But on the instances when I'm responsible for music, for other people, I will pick it. For, and I used to DJ, so I've, I've got pretty good at reading a crowd and knowing how music affects a crowd. I try to pick stuff that doesn't have vocals because... It fills the space without people, uh, how do I want to say it, caring, mm. right? There are very few genres of music you'll be able to choose that everyone will agree on. If it's high energy, I could put on some new country and tick off half the class. If I put on metal or hip hop, you know, the other half of the class might be offended, right? So it's, um, so that it doesn't leave a lot of options, but funk. You know, there's a lot of non-verbal funk, yep. jazz sort of stuff. Now, if I'm picking music for my own training, it depends on what I'm trying to do. If I'm trying to force myself to slow down and really dig into things, it could be any manner of, of slower, you know, could be pop ballad sort of stuff. Because it's more the beat that I'm looking for than anything else. If it's energy, if I'm tired, if I'm trying to lift myself up, if I'm getting myself hyped for competition, it's hip hop. Hmm. What about you, Tommy? Do you have a go-to music for training? I don't. Um, I have a very eclectic love of all kinds of genres of music. Um, as far as in the, in the classroom, in anything pretty much I'm okay with. I, I don't pick it up in my school. Necessarily, because for that very reason, that Jeremy just brought up. Um, so I just avoid it in, in class. But for my own personal, I always said if you really want to get to know somebody, ask for their playlist. So depending on 
up, if I'm ever reminiscing on something, if I really want to break my heavy bag, all those would, would definitely charge different uh, music on there. But in that playlist is a lot of different genres as well. Though. So the other thing you won't find in it is new country. So um, in that sense, but I, uh, I don't have a really go-to necessarily. It really depends on what kind of mood I'm in or what I'm looking trying to gain out of what I'm working on. Killing me. You're like right now, me. it would be death metal for the car in front of us. <laughs> uh, that would probably work. Yeah, that car almost made us death metal. Yes. Uh, more to get happy right now, Banana Rama would probably work pretty good because you can't be mad and listen to Banana Rama. That's fair. So, so just, you know, that kind of thing. I do like New Wave a lot, though. Cool. If I had a favorite. All right, so those are the questions we had. Those are some good questions. Yeah, they were good. Thank, thanks to Stephen Watson, Victor, and Noah for those questions. Fantastic. And remember, if you have questions, if you want to throw in a Q&A, it could be something simple like this, something that, you know, fairly innocuous, you're curious, but it could also be something much more substantial. If you're dealing with a, a problem, you know, we haven't done one of these for a while, but... We've done episodes where, you know, semi-anonymously, I'll bring someone on the show or they'll write in something lengthy and yep. we'll talk through it because here's the thing. If you're having the problem... In half a mile, keep left to continue on Cross County Parkway. Follow signs for George Washington Bridge, New Rochelle. Oh, people know where we are now. Oh, they do know where we are. Yeah. If you're having the problem, other people are having the problem. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. Don't hold back. And, and again, if, if you need to do it... Quietly, anonymously, we will protect Keep your identity. Keep left to continue on Cross County Parkway. Watch for the drones coming now. <laughs> if you want to support the work that we do, remember we've got a great continue Patreon. Continue on Cross County Parkway. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistle kick. <laughs> you can do as little as five bucks a month. Thank you to all the Patreon contributors. Unlike some shows, we're not going to put your name out there because that, I don't know. I find that tacky. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your watching or your listening. We appreciate you all. And until next time, train, train hard, hard, smile. I don't know. <laughs> Have a great day. Have a great day. <laughs>